Hello, welcome to this series on Rust programming. Um, we're going to be doing a few simple little tasks uh, to illustrate how you can program in Rust. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, more about why you should program in Rust later on and what kind of tasks it's most suited for. But um, to start with, we're just going to do some simple little projects which um, are kind of fun to do and sort of introduce you to, to the world of Rust. Now, the intention here today is to build a, a little digital clock, and which is a very simple little project. It's probably only about 20 lines of code um, and should be fairly easy to do. Um, I've done a little bit of the, the work beforehand. I've prepared some digits for the, for the clock, so we have a nice display. And we're going to use the uh, Linux terminal, which is what, we, what we're using here. So let's get started. Now in Rust, we um, can install Rust using a program called Rustup. Rustup, like this, and you can find that on the internet. Um, another tool we're going to be using is Visual Studio Code, um, and we can run Visual Studio Code and edit our Rust code. Um, we also uh, have installed a plugin called Rust Analyzer in Visual Studio Code, and as we'll see later on, that makes it easier to edit our Rust code. So let's get started. So as with all uh, Rust projects, when we start a new project, we just go cargo new clock, for instance, um, like this. That's now made us a directory. If I look in clock, um, we have a cargo.toml file, which contains all our dependencies, and a source directory, which contains a main.rs. There are a few other invisible files around as well, but these, these are the main things. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to edit these two files and build a little application which tells the time. So I start by calling Visual Studio Code into my directory called Clock. And here we have Visual Studio Code. So when you when you fire up Cargo New, um, you get a Hello World program um, like this. If we have Rust Analyzer installed, we can just click on this Run button, for example, and this will run my Hello World program. There we have it, Hello World. Um, so that's that's fairly straightforward. But instead of saying Hello World, let's let's make a clock instead. So um, to, for this project, I um, essentially. Uh, did a little Wikipedia search um, for um, for the graphics characters in in um, uh, the Unicode text set. So these these characters existed long before Unicode existed um, and were available on sort of you know VT52 and VT100 terminals. Um, these these graphic characters are useful for drawing various things. Um, and uh, these days, the Unicode character set has enormous numbers of things, including emojis and uh, a wide variety of different bits and pieces. Uh, so, for instance, we can kind of draw arrows of all kinds and diamonds and boxes and all, all kinds of things like this. Uh, the ones I'm going to be using today are these um, graphics characters, which are used for sort of building forms. Um, and uh, what I've done, I've uh, taken those graphics characters and I've built them into a little array like this and I'll explain what this does in a second. So there we go. So um, so these graphic characters, I'll just put an underscore in here to suppress the warning. Um, these graphic characters um, uh, allow us to do little corners, these and then we we've made I've made eleven characters um, in a uh, sort of graphical character set here. So what we have is um, each each row of this this table consists of eleven entries, each of which contains a, a string slice, which is what this thing, what I call little string, contains eleven little strings, and uh, we have seven rows to make uh, to make our to make our characters like this. If you're more enthusiastic, you can make bigger character sets like this. Uh, so this enables us, enables us to print a, a limited character set and a limited a limited set of things so how, how can we tell the time in rust um, so there's a rather nifty crate called chrono in rust um, 
So if we do a little web search for Chrome. Uh, my dyslexia and um, so particularly let's have a look at date time in chrono um, so um, so date time is a um, a structure which allows us to represent time in various ways um, so in this particular example I'm going to use local time um, which is which gives me my uh, the time uh, on my local time on my computer uh, in this case um, British summer time uh, but if you're elsewhere, it'll give you give you your local time. An alternative is to do use UTC time, and uh, that gives you a, um, a, a reference time, um, which includes things like leap seconds, um, but sort of measured from um, a point in uh, you know to January the first, nineteen seventy, typically. But it includes leap seconds, so because um, you no know, days aren't exactly twenty four hours long. So that's the that's the the, the crate I'm going to use. Um, so how how do we how do we tell the time in Rust? Let's let's just um, use date time to um, to tell the time. So the first thing we need to do is to uh, put a dependency into our cargo.toml for Corona. So we open up Corona Corona uh, cargo.toml, and we just put Corona equals say. 0 0.4. You don't have to be very accurate with the with the version. So this typically will sort of take a minimum version of 0 0.4 for the for the for the chrono crate, and um, and you can find out um, what the latest version is by looking at the documentation. So in the documentation here we can see it's 0 0.4.20. So I'm just using 0 0.4 because I'm not particularly fussed about the exact the exact version. Um, so having got chrono in there. Um, I can uh, do more things. Um, so, for instance, if I want to get the time, I can go let t equals date time. Oh, let's just use local. Local colon now. And local lo local is um, a, a structure in Chrono which kind of represents the local time. So I can. Uh, tell Rust I want to use this by putting at the top of my file use chrono local. Um, now what this does is to make local a, a key a keyword at the top level scope of this file. So um, all I have to do is type local. Um, if I didn't do this, I'd have to type chrono local local now uh, at this point. So um, so now here 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 we have our time. Um, I can debug print the time. Using printer then, so printer then. Now I'm using the debug print syntax. Curly brace colon question mark curly brace, and we're going to debug print the time. So let's see what happens when we when we debug print the time. Let's press the run button. Compiles my program, and uh, this prints a big big long string representing the time. Now we could print that string, but it's not going to be very fun. Um, so let's let's try and uh, shorten that down to just the time portion of this, so the 24-hour clock portion of uh, of this time, for example. So um, to do this, there's a there's a there's a method called format. Um, I can go t dot format, and then I need to kind of tell it what I'm formatting. So let's do hours, minutes, and seconds. And um, and then uh, I need to put that in a variable, and I need to convert it to a string because the format does what's called a delayed delayed format. It just puts enough things into a structure to tell me how to do that. But the reason for that is that when we're doing logs and things, then um, it's it's quite expensive to format time strings. So we uh, this this thing uses a, de a delayed formatting technique. So now we have now we have the time. If I print um, that time, then we should have something something a bit simpler. So that gives us just the hours, hours and minutes. Okay, doke. So we're we're doing fairly well here. Now we want our clock to run forever. So um, 
what we want to do here is put this in the loop. This is an infinite loop. This, this loop will run forever. And the, the loop um, just enables us to keep to keep running the same code. So if I if I run that code now, we get um, every second it changes. We're getting millions and millions of messages. Um, how, how can we how can we slow that down so it only gives us uh, one message every second? So um, we can, for instance, um, well, that's a, a brutal thing to do. We can sleep the thread that we're running on. So when we launch a program in in on a computer, we have a start with one thread, and uh, we can sleep that thread uh, for a for a period of time. So I can call thread stood thread sleep, and I can uh, give it a duration. For instance, stood um, time duration. Sorry about all the messages that are coming up. Um, and from millis. So we're going to do uh, do a few milliseconds. So if it is a thousand milliseconds, we'd we'd get um, the answer every second. But I want slightly shorter than a thousand milliseconds because it doesn't matter if I print it twice. Um, but um, we, we we if we on one second we may miss we may miss one time because this is this is somewhat inaccurate. So. It's not the most accurate way of telling the time. So now, now it ticks once, once for every loop we go around. Right. So that's all very well. So how can we print these nice digits um, using using my time string? What I want to do is kind of convert my time string into some nice digits to make a to make a digital clock. Um, so. Uh, what I can do is I can start by iterating over my digits, for instance. So uh, we're going to take a sort of row, a time, row at a time of my digits. So if I go for row in, um, and I'm going to put an ampersand in here, digits. Then um, I need to actually call it to digits. Now this this will give me um, you know one one row at a time from my um, from uh, my my character set. Um, so it's a bit like a, a line printer. You're probably all too young to, want to remember line printers. But line printers were great big heavy things, weighed about a ton or so, and um, had a big revolving drum with all the, with all the characters on it. And uh, essentially, we're building a line printer here. So the next thing I need to do is kind of iterate over the characters in my time string. Time, and I want to iterate as characters. Um, so I'm going to do chars like this. So this this will give me a, every character in my time string. Now the the characters um, aren't necessarily one byte in my time in my time string. They could be multiple bytes. So these these Unicode characters, for instance, um, sort of often sort of two or three bytes. So Nihal, for instance, in as a string will be uh, two characters, which are Ni and Hal. But each of those characters will be three three bytes, um, so the char's iterator will give me give me characters. But that's that's what I want in this particular case. And now I need to translate those characters. Um, I'm going to match C, um, and the match statement in Rust um, essentially matches a pattern and does something depending on what the the pattern is you found. So in this particular case. Anything between um, the zero and nine; these are contiguous digits in ASCII um, and Unicode. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, to turn that C that C into an index. So what we want to do is, is turn a character into an index into this array. So um, uh, this is index zero, this is index one, and so on, and up to here where we have index ten my colons. Let's just do the digits first. Um, and I'm going to go C as U size. Uh, U size is a special type which, we're, which we use for indexing arrays, and that's exactly what we want in this case. Then minus zero as U size. And this should give me an integer. So um, if I match that, I'll get an integer, which is the uh, between 0 and 9 inclusive. Also, I need to do 
dot dot equals, which will include the digit nine at the end. Otherwise, we won't be printing any nines. Then the next one we want to do is the colon, um, and uh, we'll just map that to to ten, which is our our end one there. And then maybe everything else we're not going to get everything anything else. We'll map that to ten as well, just for just for good measure. Now we've got a we've got a match statement which is uh, returning a number. So every every pretty much every um, uh, statement in Rust is also an expression. So this this uh, match statement will give us either um, a number between naught and nine or ten, depending on uh, which digit we want. So I'm going to set my column to to the result of this match statement like this. And now, now I have a column which is between naught and ten inclusive, um, and um, we we can use that to index index my characters. So the next thing you do, they need to do, and it's fairly simple, is just print the the relevant column of. Uh, so I'm not going to use println this time. I'm just going to use print, and I'm going to put a space after it just to put a bit of a, bit of a gap in there. And I'm going to print the column from my row like that. So um, I'm going to select select one of these uh, one of these short strings here. Um, so like that, for instance, if it's a two, I would just select that. If it's a two, um, if it's a colon, I would just select this. Uh, and all depending on which row it's on. So I'm going to start from the top, and I'm going to work down to the bottom and select the relevant row corresponding to my to my character. So this will this will print. Uh, the corresponding row of my character. Um, and then at the end of each row, I want to just use println with no arguments. And it'll print a blank, a blank line. Otherwise, all my digits are going to run run into each other. Right. Uh, so to recap what we've done right from the start, um, we started off um, we started off uh, creating a new project called Clock. Um, we ran Visual Studio Code on clock. Um, we, we now have a um, set of digits, which I prepared earlier, and um, we've made this loop here, which is going to try and uh, print our time um, using large digits, which we have stored in a table here. I'll explain the, the table in a second in more detail. So um, is it going to work? Never know. It might work. So. There's a good there's a good chance it will work because if you look at problems here, then it's currently empty. Whereas if I had if I had a formatting error, for instance, in the code, then problems will come up and say syntax error. If I if I click on that, then um, I can then edit that, and now the problems go away. So if you've done this by hand and you now have some problems, then now is the time to fix them. So examples are sort of things like missing semicolons, for instance, expected semicolon. Uh, mostly the compiler will tell you what you need to do to fix things, um, uh, but in, in this case um, it's all fairly straightforward. Um, so um, I'm fairly confident this program is going to work because um, I've written lots of programs like this before and uh, the, there's no errors now in the compiler. So one of the things about using Rust is that we know that if, if it compiles it's a good chance it's going to work. So other languages like JavaScript and Python, they'll compile very easily, uh, but they won't necessarily work. Um, in, in Rust, if it compiles, there's a good chance it's going to work. It increases the chance it's going to work. And that's why people use it in difficult situations like nuclear reactors and Linux kernels and things like this. But let's try running the program and see what happens. There we go. So we now have a digital clock. It's not maybe the prettiest digital clock, digital clock in the world, but at least it's a digital clock. Now, there's various things we can do to improve this. Um, uh, so, for instance, um, let's just press Control C on this thing to stop the clock. So we've stopped the clock at 13, 36, 35. There we go. And um, so we, we have a we have a sort of basic clock. Obviously, if you're feeling creative, you can uh, change this and uh, put different different characters in here. So. Rust strings allow Unicode characters, which is what these things are. Um, I can say I've stolen them from um, the, the Unicode standard. Um, and in this case, um, uh, the, each of these is an array of 11 little strings. 
ampersand strur is a little what I call a little string. It's a string slice. It's got both an address of the first byte in the in the string, and a length of the string. In this case, although there are uh, a fixed number of characters in each of these strings, well, variable number of characters in fact, but um, even though there's a fixed number of characters in the strings, then uh, there won't be a, fi a fixed number of bytes. Each of these, each, although each of these strings looks the same length, they they won't actually be the same number of bytes um, because Unicode represents uh, some characters with more bytes. So um, the, outer, the outermost array is the seven seven rows of uh, of of, um, of of strings like this. So that's the eleven is the number of uh, strings in the in in the inner inner part of the array, and the seven is the number of rows in the in the array in general. Um, so when I iterate over rows, I get exactly seven rows in this case, and I'm choosing from um, 11 different columns. So if I made a mistake here in the match statement and I put 11, for instance, in here, then the code will panic, and um, or uh, well, the code would panic, and uh, uh, panicking means the program will just stop and crash and give you a stack dump. Um, so Rust will always check the array bounds. Um, this is another reason why it's um, better for sort of mission critical uh, applications than C, for example, which will just ha happily carry on working um, until it doesn't uh, a year later. So um, we're picking out characters and printing them, and that's our that's our basic loop. How can we make this prettier? Let's get rid of the the time print I had originally. Um, now there's there's a few useful things we can do. Um, so if you if you go onto Wikipedia and um, search for um, so here we have a, a thing we want to look for the um, ANSI um, ANSI characters uh, escape sequences escape codes for example ANSI escape code in Wikipedia um, so the the terminals we use are ANSI ANSI terminals um, which have been used on a variety of different operating systems. Um, uh, kind of started life as sort of uh, sort of VT52 and VT100 on on uh, terminals. So, um, for instance, I've, I've I've used these things in the past. These are these are DEC VT VT100 terminals. They're a very common terminal at one point. Um, and uh, we also I also helped develop terminals here in the UK, which use similar similar escape sequences. Um, so there are there are a vast vast set of terminals and. These days, Unix-like systems mostly tend to emulate these terminals. So, for instance, GNOME terminal, which we're using here, essentially is is um, is an emulation of of the the ANSI escape codes. Uh, so, there's various things we can do with the ANSI escape codes. We can ring the bell, for example. So, on on the original teletypes, you could ring the bell and annoy everyone, or or you know, play terrible tunes on the on the bell of the teletype. Um, Again, you're probably too young to remember teletypes, um, but there was a time when almost every business had a, had a teleprinter or a teletype. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things we can do like this. Um, we can move the cursor around like this, um, and in particular, what I want to be able to do is clear the screen. So, um, so arrays in display is is what we need. So, um, so there's various options. Um, so this CSI is means escape open square bracket, um, and escape is a control character one B in in hex, um, and uh, escape open square bracket, and then uh, a, typically a number or a letter. Um, so in this case, um, so we got some numbers, and we're going to we're going to clear clear the display. The number we want in this case is two, which will will just clear the entire screen. Without clearing the history buffer, which we could clear the scroll back. But let's try a three. Let's try a three there. So let's do do um, um, do um, uh, an escape code at the start to clear the screen. So if I go print again without printer, then um, so to do the escape, I do um, back, backslash ox or just backslash x x one b x one b um, and open square bracket, which is the CSI part of this. Um, then we're going to go three capital J, and we're going to hope that's going to clear the screen. So let's let's try that. 
and um, so we're, we're printing three, uh, four characters here. Escape, which is hex encoded in this case, backslash x one b square bracket three j. Let's run that. Right. So as you can see, it's um, failing, to, failing to clear the screen. Just to show this is this is a live demo. Let's try the two one. Ah, oh, there we go. Now it's still failing to clear the screen. But let's let's not let's not worry about that for the time being. So um, uh, the other thing we can do is hide the cursor. So here's here's one I prepared earlier, which which um, hides the cursor. This will now we don't have the cursor in in, in our display like this. And the final thing we do is we want to move our cursor up to the top so that we're not creating new lines every time we, we print this. So the escape code for moving moving the cursor up to the top um, is this. Um, this will move the character up the cursor up seven times. So escape open square bracket seven A will move the character moves the cursor up seven seven characters. So let's run that. There we go, now it's actually working. So, um, so that's, that's our sort of basic clock. Um, if you felt like improving it and uh, changing the character set and um, uh, setting alarms and all kinds of things like that, then uh, then you can do that. So that's how do we how do we publish our clock and um, uh, you know, put it as a crate and allow other people to install uh, install our clock. So let's go back to the command line here. Um, so. Um, if I go into clock, um, if I wanted to, it probably is a clock crate already, but if I wanted to publish my clock, my, uh, my, my clock, I can go pargo publish, um, and that will put it on crates IO. Uh, but there is a clock, and I don't particularly want to use the name clock anyway. Um, so let's not do that for the moment. The, the other thing I can do is I can go cargo install um, minus minus path dot that will install clock as a program on my computer. So um, probably already is a clock, um, but I've got a particular clock, which is now my local one. So if I run run clock as a command line thing, there we have a there we have a clock, um, and um, I can you know shrink the window down, for example, and um, like that. Oops, it's messed up the formatting a bit, but. Um, Oop, don't shrink it too much because then it wraps. There we go. Anyway, something like that. Um, and now, now we have a desktop clock. Wow, amazing! There we go. We've done something in Rust. So this this is a relatively simple project. You know, hopefully you can um, do do the same thing. Uh, I'll try and post the code up somewhere so you can see it. Um, so happy rusting! And uh, if you're new to Rust, then simple projects like this will hopefully motivate you to to um, do some great things. Okay, thank you, bye-bye.